Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to do this talk in 15 minutes, which I normally do in 45 or 50 minutes, which is going to be fun. So this is seven reasons why your microservices you use event sourcing and CQRS real fast. So the uh, we're going to walk through these seven reasons, but it really I've got a reason zero, which is what is event sourcing and CQRS, if you're not familiar with it. Um, in general, event sourcing and CQRS is essentially splitting up how you persist data. So there is a concept of a write side and a read side. So state changes to your data happen on the write side. And then queries happen on what's called the read side. And these are two different databases, typically. They're not, and, the, and one of the biggest things is that they're not transaction, transactionally linked. So the flow is what's kind of shown in this diagram where there's requests that are coming in are con that do state changes are, are considered to be commands. So those, those commands are uh, intense to do something. Those commands produce events, and events are historical facts. They're like an immutable historical facts. So what you're storing on the right side is just the events. So it, for example, in a shopping cart, add item, remove item, update item, each one of those things is a key value pair, essentially, that's inserted into an event log. So the right side is a real simple and very, very fast insert-only data store. On the other hand, the read side is where you do your queries. So the read side is optimized for querying only. So this is the real, this is the segregation, you know, the command query responsibility segregation. You're segregating commands are handled on one side in one form of persistence and queries are handled on the other side. It's a really interesting pattern for uh, doing persistence. So like I say, you have these, uh, the, uh, the events going into the right side and the queries being pulled against the read side. So that's CQRS really fast. Event sourcing is CQRS really fast. Now, reason one, that there's a smooth transition from design, particularly domain-driven design and event storming, and now I'm also seeing things like event modeling, into implementation because you're thinking about events. The idea with domain-driven design, and, and in particular, I'm not a domain-driven design person. I'm a developer. But what I'm interested in is the output of this effort. And, and the, the output of this effort is that you're doing some kind of domain-driven design and, and event storming or event modeling. You're starting to think about events. You're trying to, you're trying to identify the system from a, purely from a design standpoint. But part of the conversation that's going on is a very event-oriented kind of conversation. So the outcome of that exercise is you're supposed to come out with an idea of the kinds of microservices that you're going to build and also the commands and events that uh, go into these different microservices. You know, the, the commands that go into these uh, microservices and the events that these microservices produce. That flows very, very nicely into microservices that are implemented using event sourcing and CQRS because we're implementing our code and we're implementing our data, you know, persisting our data kind of in this event mindset way of doing things. So it's, it's, um, it's a nice flow from design into implementation. A uh, big thing with microservices, I think, is, is reducing coupling. And I think it's one of the biggest you know, mistakes that I think we make when we implement microservices. We, we take some of our old ways of doing things and we, and we you know, say the monolithic ways of doing things that we perpetuated into doing microservices, like, you know, restful remote procedure calls, for example. So anyways, um, micro, you know, the, this event sourcing in CQRS kind of, I think, helps you get out of that, that mindset where two services that interact with each other are interacting with each other indirectly. You know, it's easier to do this kind of flow where uh, service one maybe does something that service three is inter interested in, but service one and service three aren't tightly coupled, say, with doing HTTP RESTful calls. It's more of a flow of events. You know, events are being captured in one microservice that other, subscri other microservices subscribe to. You know, events are very, you know, basically uh, a, you know, a form of publishing. You're, you're publishing things that have happened, historical facts of things that have happened in your service, which other services are picking up. 
the interesting thing I think is that even when we, I mean, very commonly we're using things like Kafka for doing messaging, but even the propagation of messages between um, you know, one microservice into Kafka and out to, out, out to another microservice, when you really get paranoid about the actual delivery of those, all every single one of those messages, and you have to think through, uh, you know, are there any possibilities for leaks in our in the pipes? The this way of doing things, you know, this eventing way of doing things is um, typically a pattern that it's easier to make sure that you can build these pipelines of, you know, of data flowing from one microservice to another without having any leaks in your pipes. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more later on. But it's really kind of breaking the mode of thinking about that whole remote procedure call, restful kind of remote procedure call way of linking services together. Um, versus, you know, the you know doing the synchronous versus the asynchronous. You know, so, ideally, the messaging between services is asynchronous as well. I know it's not always possible, but the the goal is that it should be. Now, it's almost the other thing I want to say is that initially, if you're new to this, it's hard to think about doing things in an asynchronous flow versus getting into kind of an uh, asynchronous way of a mindset. But once you kind of get used to it, it's, it's, it's something new that we have to learn how to do. But it works. People are doing it. Continuing on, uh, break the read versus write performance bottleneck. What I mean by this is that, you know, with a, a typical system that many of us, I think, have probably built over the years is we're we're going to a single database, we're doing some kind of CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete, and you're optimizing that database for reads and writes. But it's always a trade-off. If you optimize for reads, it comes at the expense of writes. If you optimize for writes, it comes at the expense of reads. So there's always these big trade-offs that are going on when you're, when you're doing these kinds of things. This is another advantage, I think, with uh, the event sourcing in CQRS, because you've got the segregated persistence. On the one hand, you've got the event store, which is only against you're just inserting events. You know, look, again, the the, uh, the order model, add item, remove item, update item, add shipping address, add billing address. All these things are just stored as events. All those events aggregate up to this current state of the order. If you built, you know, take all the events and replay them, you can rebuild, you know, what the order looks like right now. But the the Advantages from a performance standpoint is that your, if say you get a spike in traffic, so to capture each change to the order, for example, you're just inserting add item, update item, remove item, and the right side can zoom ahead because basically all you're doing is updates, I'm, I'm sorry, inserts into the event log. Now the read side is running asynchronously, is trying to keep up with the right side, but maybe it falls behind. So the, the, the cost of this is that there's an eventual consistency uh, that, that goes between the right side and the read side because you, you're asynchronous to the updating. It's not a single transaction where you're writing an event in the event log and you're updating the read side. It's two separate transactions. You simple insert, done. Go back to the customer and say, yep, I got what your change. Now the system in uh, behind the scenes is is updating the the read side as quickly as possible, but maybe it's falling behind. But it's not at the expense of increased response times for the customer. This was a big one for me, um, elevating the concurrency barrier, because I've been bitten by this so much in the past. Where you know you build a system, it you know. Good old CRUD-based system. You're on some nice, you know, good old. Like a lot of my stuff used to be on Oracle databases. I I worked at Hewlett Packard, a big, huge enterprise, um, enterprise IT. We build these systems, and then boom, we get a spike in traffic. And it might not be a seasonal spike. It might just be, you know, a monthly spike or a weekly spike or whatever. But we run into a situation where the we're not having problems with, say. Scaling on the application side, we got plenty of capacity there. We're not CPU bound, we're not memory bound, we're database bound. And when you have an application that's database bound and you need to fix it, it can be extremely painful. 
And at least that's been in my experience. And, you know, the, the alarms go off, you start talking to the DBAs, and, oh, yeah, we can fix this, and then two, three, four weeks later, they're still working on it, and you're still running into a situation where the database is just pushed to its limit and it can't go any faster. Not a lot of applications run into this, but when you do have an application where it could be possible where you're pushing the database, you know, the database technology you're using faster than it can handle, that's a really bad place to be because it's a hard problem to fix. This is another reason why this is becoming a popular approach, this event sourcing in CQRS, is that you've got this whole, again, very simple data store, the event log. And say you've got a spike, and I'm showing like, you know, the read side is way behind, you know, the, the line is down below, but the right side, you know, is way, af way ahead. Because we took this spike, and we're just insert, 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 insert into the event log, and we're not waiting for the read side to catch up. You know, it, um, we're not making the customer, the user, wait for the read side to catch up. Messaging is another one, simplifying hardened messaging. This is, again, this is a big one, I think. When you look at the semantics of messaging, it kind of breaks down into three categories. And when you get into distri distributed systems, this gets really interesting. I think this is one of the most interesting features or things that we have to learn as developers about distributed systems, you know, moving from monoliths to microservices and to serverless, is that there's at most once, or at least once, and there's exactly once. But what at most once, I like to call it maybe once, which means that the, the message might not get delivered. In fact, the other way to put it is that under certain circumstances, you will lose messages. So is that ex an acceptable feature of your application or not? When you ask the business, usually it's like, no, it's not. You, know, you don't want to lose any messages. If you lose messages, you're a jerk, right? They get mad at you. Customers get mad at you. you the business gets mad at, mad at you. The managers get mad at you. Then there's at least once, which means once or more, which is this is the easiest thing to implement and it's the most common one to implement in messaging, but what that means is that the consumer has to be aware that it's going to get every single message, but it might get some messages twice, or more than, more than twice, but usually twice, because there's just, you're kind of dealing with the laws of physics here between systems, you know, that there's latencies and delays, you're going over networks and so on. And then there's also kind of the, the <laughs> mythical exactly once, or I call it essentially once, and if you look at the end of the end flow of messages from the producer to con consumer and you walk through it, whatever implement implementation you look at, the, there's big challenges for exactly once on the producer side, and there's also challenges on the consumer side. Now, when you see or hear about an exactly once implementation, which is doable, but it's usually from the perspective of the consumer. So anyways, the, our intuition often is that the producer is responsible for pushing out the data. Right? So when you're pushing out the data and you want at least once messaging, then you have to worry about, well, sometimes messages don't get delivered the first time you try. So you have to have some kind of retry logic. When you implement some retry logic, you have to start thinking about, well, you've got a producer, some service is trying to publish data, and it has to be capable of being in that mode where some messages haven't been delivered and it's retrying, and that service goes down. So when that service comes back up, can it pick up where it left off and continue to retry sending those messages? That adds a lot of complexity to the producer. Another one I want to point out is, well, it's like, well, we got Kafka. Everything's cool. But it's like, OK, fine. But say your service does a database transaction f first, and then it makes a call to Kafka. Well, guess what? Those are two separate transactions. So what happens when? the database transaction occurred, but you didn't get the message into Kafka. You know, so you, that's a leak in your pipe. You, you have a potential vulnerability there where when the service goes down, in, when you, during that period of vulnerability, you can lose messages. So this is where I think often a pull approach is simpler. And this is what Kafka does. Kafka consumers pull from, they're not, messages aren't pushed to Kafka consumers, Kafka consumers pull. So the pull pattern often is easier to implement. And eliminate service coupling. Real quick, um, the idea is that, you know, a common pattern is where, say we have a customer service that is servicing these other four services. And when it goes down, 
all the other four services go down. So pattern that some people are starting to look at is using um, this approach where the cu customer publishes and the other, mes other services consume. And then so that when the customer service goes down, nobody cares. And one last thing, I'm running over time, is graduate from the IT nursery. And what I mean by this is that the often when you try and in introduce this new way of doing persistence, the, it's such a culture shock to your organization that you're talking about like two different schemas and so on, that it it's, can be difficult, but it's good. Because in a way, what I'm saying is that, you know, I c in, especially in enterprise space where you have governance, and it's like you have to talk to DBAs about making schema changes and all these kind of things. We don't, we don't have the time for that anymore. We're supposed to be moving fast. This is one of the reasons why we're going to more fine-grained code. So the, the, the idea is that um, governance is trying to prevent you from doing something wrong or doing something uh, in a bad way versus experience, especially doing it in fine-grained, is where you can learn quickly from your mistakes you know, as an organization and pick up. So I'll leave you with this last part. People are very open-minded about new things as long as they're exactly like the old ones. And this is, this is just fatal for us as in our business. You know, we have to be open-minded to new things and trying new things. And, and again, this event sourcing at CQRS can make people's head hurt, but I think it's a real powerful pattern, and I, I really like it for all these reasons. So there's the, there's the seven reasons. Thank you very much.